And we are also joined from, by colleagues from the coordination team here at Kabul. We have um, Mohamed Bakir, he is the Deputy Shelter Cluster Coordinator from UNHCR. We also have Hashim Mohamed, the Deputy Cluster Co-Chair from IRM. In addition to that, we have the Information Management Team, Randa Chandra and Jamal Abdullah. Hakim Harris and Basir Ahmad from Ireland. Um, together, we also have other colleagues from the subnational cluster, as well as partners for, who um, who also work here in Afghanistan. So we hope you'll find this session interesting and useful. Without wasting much time, I will hand over to Amadi to kickstart the presentation. Welcome, Amadi. Thank you, Patrick. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to colleagues who have joined today. Um, uh, so, um, Patrick, I will be requesting uh, the control. If you could please accept that so I can change the slides. I think you're good. Mm, not sure, but I cannot change. Anyways, I think I you can change it for me for until sure. I get the access, so it should be fine. Thank you, colleagues. So I, I will just get you through the presentation overview where we have um, several slides uh, and would like to explain what uh, um, the cluster in Afghanistan is doing. It would be focused on our coordination structure, uh, the context and the population that we target in the country, uh, humanitarian response planning overview and the cluster plan under the HRP. We will also discuss a little bit on standard responses uh, under the cluster, uh, cluster standards that we currently have, uh, over an overview of the stockpile, uh, preparedness activities that we are carrying out this year for 2021, um, the cluster coordination performance monitoring uh, and that, that was carried out uh, beginning this year and the action plan that is developed uh, following that consultation, the assessments that we are planning this year uh, for 2021 local art architecture study that was done this year uh, and of course touching base on major challenges and gaps that we have in the cluster um, i hope uh, you you can hear me correct yes somebody we can hear you. all right so moving to the uh, next slide which is um Basically, uh, the coordination structure for the shelter cluster in Afghanistan. So the cluster was activated in March uh, 2008. Uh, the cluster is actually led by UNICR and I am the co-chair in the country. Well, uh, we do have a setup in the country where I am is lead the lead responder in natural disaster setting where they mainly provide uh, NFIs and emergency shelter while UNICR is leading on conflict displacement response. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, in many instances as a last resort to support the responses uh, in the country. We have sub, uh, we have eight sub uh, national cluster uh, in eight regions that are north, northeast, central, central highland, West region, South, East and Southeast region. Uh, uh, national and regional um, cluster is actually represented by UNICR and IOM. We also have uh, 34 cluster focal points in all 34 provinces. These are the partners that are that have volunteered to uh, assess the cluster and serve as a focal point in, in 34 provinces. Uh, uh, overall, the uh, coordination structure is uh, led by OCHA and the ICCT, of course, is uh, led by OCHA. We are the shelter cluster is also member together with other clusters. 
um, which also leads the cluster coordination mechanism at regional level where we have a humanitarian response teams that are operational and coordinating assessments and response. At provincial level, we have operation coordination team that are smaller and at, at provincial level that are actually led by OCHA, but of course there are other partners who, who also take lead in terms of the operational presence. Uh, the government also uh, is member to many of these coordination forums. They also lead responses through uh, PDMC, which is Provincial Disaster Management Committees. Uh, the governor leads the, the forum and it is uh, co-chaired or se the secretary is actually ANMA. We currently have 42 pa active partners across the country. We also have a strategic advisory group that constitutes 10 members. Of course, two of them are donors that are uh, two, two of them are observers. Well, this is this is actually the, the, the structure, the organogram of the cluster. Uh, we of course the cluster actually uh, is under the humanitarian coordinator. Then both agencies heads are uh, actually leading the, 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 the cluster, but uh, um, UNICR is the lead and then IOM is the co-chair for the cluster. Similarly, uh, we, we have deputy uh, coordinator and deputy co-chairs. We also have a very uh, uh, competent team of information management. Uh, both organizations have two to contribute towards the cluster. Uh, and similarly, at regional level, we also have a dedicated coordination team. Uh, well, one of the differences that we have this year, uh, we at the regions, we were mostly our colleagues from both organizations were double hatting and we did not we did not have dedicated staff. Unfortunately, this year, this year, both organization has brought in a dedicated staffing, which means that we have coordinators and co-chairs that are dedicated to the cluster coordination efforts, which is a very positive uh, uh, thing this year, which is actually changed this year. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, so we also have 34 uh, provincial focus points that are mostly our partners who have volunteered to to serve as a focal point where we which are connected to our regional coordination team and we get information from there. Now I won't go into the details. This is the map of uh, our regional coordination team and their contact details. So if you want to get in touch with any of them, of course, it also includes the national cluster coordination team as well. Uh, well, uh, talking a little bit about the context in the country and the population group that falls under our mandate and that that we that uh, that the cluster and uh, actually our partners serve. Uh, well, uh, you uh, majority of you may already know the country. Uh, um, uh, well, we we have uh, ongoing conflict displacements. We have uh, uh, ongoing conflict in, in majority parts of the country that actually has resulted in displacements. Uh, we also the country is also prone to multiple natural disasters. Uh, of course, since uh, I think for the last 20 years due to ongoing conflict, we also have not only conflict, but also uh, multiple, uh, I mean, I mean uh, due to drought, we also have displacements that have ended up into protected situations. So we are not only dealing with new displacements, but we also have vulnerable groups that have ended up into protected situations. So this is also one of the areas where a cluster supports uh, COVID-19 2020-21. It has added up to the to the vulnerabilities, of course, the socioeconomic situation of those that are most vulnerable were impacted. So they are also the, their vulnerability has increased. So the cluster in well, the, the humanitarian team but, uh, in general, but uh, the cluster in specific also supports this group through partners. Uh, well, uh, one of the reasons, one of the areas where we uh, we also support uh, uh, population uh, uh, that has also, of course, resulted in uh, displacements and vulnerability is the insecurity, ongoing conflict, uh, the challenges and access issues that we that we currently have. You also might be aware of the current context in the country. There, there are there there are a lot of. Uh, 
efforts in terms of inter-Afghan uh, inter -Afghan negotiation peace talks uh, that, that is that has also a lot of uh, political uh, uh, issues around, but of course this has also resulted in in, in continuous and deteriorating situ conflict situation that has also resulted in displacements. We would also probably touch base later on on projected drought. We have, uh, well, this year we have La Nina year and uh, uh, there are 25 provinces that are at risks of drought and, and, and its impact, of course, on the livelihoods of the population that are that rely on agriculture. Population groups that we target, uh, newly displaced population, uh, internally displaced that are due to conflict or natural disaster, uh, cross-border returns, mostly Afghans that are returning from Pakistan and Iran, uh, shock-affected non-displaced people, refugees and asylum seekers, and other vulnerable groups that are in need of humanitarian assistance. Uh, well, uh, well, the, uh, we have also divided this into uh, our responses are major in, in the in the four quarters. So the first quarter is usually our winterization response, where we also uh, work together with our government counterpart and partners. We do develop a winterization strategy where we have uh, uh, responses to the, the most vulnerable that are that are in this in this population group. So what we do, we provide them different types of assistance that include cash for winterization, shelter, NFI, and winter clothing. Uh, last year, our, our winterization response for 2021 ended. Now we are planning to start planning for 2021 and 2022. Second quarter, where we are at the moment, we usually have uh, uh, spring flash floods that, uh, that 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 actually results in a lot of uh, destruction in almost all the regions. Uh, uh, so far, uh, we, we will present it later on on what's going on this year. But this 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 the second quarter is mostly uh, where we have flash floods. Now the fourth quarter is again conflict. We 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 also so, sorry I forgot the third spring offensive again this this time of the year because winter is just over. So we have spring offensive where conflict in majority part of the country increases and it, it definitely results in uh, displacements. I already mentioned about drought, which is one of the factors that we that we, we we have considered in our planning this year. We also under ICCT we have developed spring contingency plan that is not only focused on on drought but it also covers all other areas, including natural disaster and other vulnerable groups for the next four months. So we are part of that spring ICCT spring contingency plan. Uh, just to provide you an overview of the humanitarian response plan for 2021, uh, Afghanistan this year, uh, well, the, the projected uh, people in need this year is 18.4 million, of which uh, humanitarian or uh, have planned to uh, actually reach to 15.7 million people, for which 1.3 billion uh, fund is required. Now, specific to the shelter cluster, our uh, our target our, our people in need is 6.6 .6 million, of which we are targeting one one million people this year, and it requires 109 million dollars. And uh, as I said earlier, we have 42 partners, operational partners that are working throughout the country. Uh, down you in the table, you would see the details of and the breakdown of our proposed activities, the funding, uh, uh, the funding requirements. So it's basically the standard uh, activities that we have under the cluster. Now, uh, moving to the key figures this year for 2021. So far, uh, over 100,000 people have been displaced and this is, continues to increase. Uh, recently, just, just we, we had a regional, uh, we, we had a cluster meeting with our regional focal points today and we have been hearing uh, a lot of uh, uh, recently displaced population in, in, in eastern region, in south and northeast. Uh, some of these are quite 
significant in number, and it, it's because of the, the 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 changes in the dynamic and in the deteriorating situation in the conflict. So the, the, this is where our partners and clusters uh, and our cluster coordination team are busy with at the moment. So this is actually the time where we have increased in the number of displacements due to conflict. Uh, of 29 of 34 provinces, 29 provinces are affected by natural disaster as we talk today since beginning of January. Uh, around 78 natural disaster incidents were recorded, majority of which were flooding in 21 provinces. Over 2,000 families affected, and as we talk, there are ongoing assessments. We do have challenges around access, so there are also a little bit delays in assessments. So these are the challenges of the country. Uh, this has resulted in, uh, uh, well, uh, around 80 persons have been killed due to natural disasters, 54 injured. These are the initial reports that we have received from different provinces through through assessments. Uh, uh, well, uh, it, the, 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 flat, the flooding and, and generally the natural disaster has uh, resulted in destruction of uh, over 400 houses and around 17 houses damaged. Uh, five percent uh, as generally the cluster is at the moment uh, um, five, five percent funded and and uh, I think majority portion of this also is coming from our pre last year's transfers of funds so uh, one of the major issues that we have been discussing today at ICCT and have been discussing in all other forums is to uh, uh, advocate for increase uh, you know for 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 funding and one of the things that I mean we also had a presentation at HCT last week so we are putting all efforts but fortunately we recently received five million USD uh, from AHF which is Afghanistan humanitarian fund and we are currently busy in reviewing the proposals. Uh, now, critical drivers, I think shelter shelter is one of the uh, major needs and I think and it is actually one of the most underfunded activities for the cluster. Well, this is one of the major needs because of the many reasons that are explained in the slide overcrowded shelters and you know the poor condition of the shelters that actually is not in line with the standards. So these are the population that really need shelter support. Majority of the uh, population that are recently displaced need shelter and some of the some of these family actually lives in open air. We have just received some reports from let's say in Lagman today where we saw families who are displaced have no place to live. So they're living in open. So the shelter intervention is one of the major needs in the country. Damage shelter, this is both because of the natural disasters and, and also because of the uh, conflicts. Uh, and uh, of course, the government capacities and resources are also limited, so they also cannot provide enough support to the families to, to, to have shelters. Uh, uh, lack of basic household items. This is one of our major interventions in the country where partners contribute towards addressing the non-food item needs. Uh, we also have uh, makeshift shelters uh, that are constructed by those that are recently displaced and those that are in protected situation. Uh, this, this, this is, these are the groups that actually also need shelter intervention and shelter support. Substandard rental accommodation, those that are displaced, they, they need to shel take shelter somewhere. So one of the solution they find is they rent accommodations that are again not uh, standard shelters so this is also one of the area where the cluster supports with the limited resources we have those informal settlements uh, if i give an example of west uh, uh, when when these display when these families displays they 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 live in the areas that are probably owned by private uh, sector or by, by by it's the owners are private so there are also fear of eviction and and we have multiple examples where they are forced to evacuate so these families are also in need of shelter and and the cluster is trying their best to also support them and we have been supporting them in the past with the limited resources that we have lack of privacy for women and girls especially in in, in informal settlements lack of livelihood uh, with the ongoing conflict uh, the poverty in the country 
and um, of course the current scenario of drought where livelihoods are impacted there are made made agriculture that's also one of the reasons why they the, the the most vulnerable family cannot afford to construct shelter for the sense or live in a standard shelter lack of land and security of tuner it's another issue of course a very complicated we also work together with HLP to support the government. Uh, land allocation is a major issue here in the country. There are a lot of issues around uh, within within uh, within ministries. So if land is located, there are always disputes that arise, and we do have some examples in the past. Uh, increase in rental market. Uh, well, uh, when influx of displacements happen in a urban area in a center which usually happens in, in provincial centers it automatically uh, impacts the market increases the prices uh, which is also difficult for the for the idps to 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 support increase in the number of informal settlements um well um, just in Kabul, we have over 50 informal settlements and there are many informal settlements and other major provinces as well so that that's also one of the reasons knowing the fact that we do not have uh, cccm cluster operational in the country so we as a cluster have to contribute to uh, to, to resources that, that we have so these are one of uh, these are uh, uh, reasons for the critical drivers for the shelter needs in the country Patrick, thank you. Thank you very much. It's it's over to you, Patrick. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'll t I'll take you guys through this last part of our, our presentation, and uh, I'll start by um, highlighting the the shelter needs that we have at a glance. So, based on various assessments that uh, we've done over the past uh, months or so, um, shelter needs have been cited as the second highest priority. This is after food. 77% uh, cited food, while 72% cited shelter. 1.4 million people displaced for the past six months or so reside in poor shelter conditions. We also have 81% of IDPs having inadequate uh, heating sources during winter. So the need of winterization is really quite high as um, we head towards the winter season, towards the end of the year. 60% of the IDPs have less than one blanket uh, per person. This is one key NFI gap. And then we have 4.9 million IDPs who have been displaced since 2012, and they continue to remain in urban and rural informal settlements where they live in substandard shelters as well as uh, overcrowded settings. And uh, Amadi has highlighted some of these uh, key needs that we have. Um, in terms of the reach that we have had so far uh, this first um, few months of the year, uh, so far we have reached 380,000 or so people with the uh, ES uh, NFI needs. As we have over 100 uh, people receiving NFI assistance, most of them being the displaced that uh, were highlighted before. We have also managed to support 1,747 people with emergency shelter assistance. This includes a uh, cash for rent. 170,000 people have received assistance for shelter repair and shelter upgrade, mainly affected by flooding. 170,000 people have received winterization assistance. As you saw, um, our circle of assistance, the first part of the year, we do um, a lot of winterization assistance. 6,200 people receive transitional shelter assistance. Um, I know you have noted that, um, as, as you mentioned, we are really underfunded. So it would raise question, how did we manage to uh, reach 380,000 people? We mainly managed to do this uh, through carryover funding from 2020. So partners um, had purchased items at the end of uh, last year, and most of these are the items that we use, as well as uh, items that we have prepositioned. So this we have in a dashboard and uh, we'll put a link there when we share the uh, presentation we can get to see. To move in a bit more detail in terms of our standard responses, um, we have this flowchart that details uh, how we respond here in Afghanistan. 
uh, in the event of displacement, mainly due to conflict or natural disasters, we respond to um, people who are residing in open air market, open air areas by um, providing emergency sh uh, shelter assistance. This we always do in kind, and it's, it's mainly tents that we provide. And then for NFIs and winterization, we check the functionality of the markets. And if there are functional markets, we provide cash or vouchers. If there is no functional market, we provide in kind. Um, we also have some cases of displaced uh, res residing with host community or renting. So for these cases, we support them. Um, if there are functional markets, we provide them with uh, vouchers and cash. And if there's no functional market, we support them with NFI, uh, with, with in-kind items. And of course, we also provide uh, rental support for such cases. Um, in other cases, we have the government providing uh, um, areas where we uh, develop camps to support them. For such cases, we uh, respond with the emergency shelter support in kind, then the same approach also by assessing the functionality of the markets. For those who are non-displaced, we respond uh, in terms of either materials, cash support or trainings. and. Um, we have different shelter programming uh, uh, responses that we do for this. So we provide NFIs, we provide shelter materials, we provide toolkits, winterization, conditional and unconditional cash. We provide vouchers and we also provide building better um, uh, uh, trainings and uh, dis 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 disaster risk reduction activities with that. Um, these are the cluster standards that we provide. So they are uh, classified into two. There's the emergency solutions as well as our transitional solutions. To move into the specifics for emergency solutions, we have a standard em emergency shelter kit. As I had mentioned before, for this we provide tents and two plastic sheets in kind. And then we also provide a standard emergency NFI kits. Uh, this is provided in kind and it constitutes a blanket, solar panels, cooking pots, kitchen items, jerry cans, mats, and clothing. Uh, in other cases, if the markets are functional, we do provide uh, in kind, in kind, in, in cash uh, support, uh, which uh, amounts to 105 USD. Uh, for repair cases, we have toolkits that we provide, ropes for shovel, axe, trowel, hammer, and wheelbarrow. And uh, if markets allow, we provide uh, $50 for this. We have winterization uh, package, which uh, includes heating items, a gas cylinder, and uh, fuel, uh, amounting uh, USD 200. And um, if uh, this is in kind and in cash, it's broken down into a gas cylinder costing $20 and cash voucher for gas, $180 that can take them through um, around six months. Uh, we also do cash for rental assistance. This we give $75 for a maximum of three months. There is also shelter upgrades based on assessments. For severe damage, we provide USD 500. For minor damage, we provide USD 300. And uh, finally, we do provide winter clothing equivalent $65 and also a blanket package equivalent to $40. Transitional shelter solutions, um, we do have this, though we have uh, really haven't received um, adequate funding for this. And this is one of the key advocacies that we do to try to increase the transitional shelter support that we provide here. So we do have a T-shelter design that is of one room with a corridor of 825 by 400 uh, centimeters, and it's uh, it's uh, made of stone masonry wall. And in other cases, we also have brick walling and brick with a chakwa plate for roofing. This is uh, like burnt uh, tiles. Um, in other cases, we also provide uh, in cash for uh, shelter construction, and it amounts to 1,250 and includes technical support on uh, quality uh, of materials and also construction, monitoring, and wash integration. And we 
monitor our stockpiles uh, across the country. So we have prepositioned um, NFIs uh, as well as emergency shelters and uh, shelter repair toolkits across the country. And um, as of April 2021, we have over 30,000 NFI kits, uh, 13,000 emergency shelter kits, and 9,000 repair toolkits. As it looks there, it might look a lot, but it's really quite small. Um, we were just discussing today at the ICCT the need for uh, replenishment of stocks in country, considering the current uh, conflict incidents, that's incidences that you are currently facing. So as time goes by, we'll continue depleting this and uh, we might face challenges in the next coming months. In terms of preparedness activities, specifically for displacement, um, as I mentioned, we uh, prioritize cash for rent for IDPs in urban areas, and um, for other areas, we provide em emergency shelter support, NFIs, shelter repair kits, and um, winterization. So the preparation, pre preparation activities that we are doing here is we are closely monitoring the pipeline uh, of stocks, and um, also prepositioning items in areas that we feel are hotspots. As we all know, early procurement and prepositioning is key in getting ahead of any access and transport challenges. And it's one of the advocacy um, messages that, messages that uh, we are passing across to our donors. We need to get funding now before things get worse because it becomes a challenge to transport these items to some of these locations. We are also doing partner mapping capacity mapping and encouraging our partners to look at their business continuity plans so that we ensure that we stay and deliver in the event that um, things go bad. Um, we support the government and ICCT in identifying hotspots for displacements and also looking at displacement uh, site mapping. As Amadi mentioned, we do not have CCCM here. Um, and it's one key gap if, uh, say, for example, the displacement uh, sites uh, increase as we go by um, in this uh, time of conflict. Um, we also focus on multi-sectoral approach. This is to ensure that um, uh, our assistance uh, does not uh, get diverted, um, mainly, for example, in drought uh, cases, as uh, Amadi mentioned, we have we expect drought this year, so we intend to support other clusters in responses at places of origin, so as to prevent displacement. Because it's um, it will definitely be um, uh, much more uh, affordable to support them where they are uh, rather than uh, having to be faced with displacement uh, from their places of origin. Uh, finally, June 20, 2021 will begin preparation for winterization for 2020-2022. This we need to do early so as to make sure that we have the items in place on time before the winter uh, begins. Um, we would like to highlight a bit on some of the cluster coordination performance monitoring action plan that uh, we have agreed upon here as a cluster. So we conducted a workshop early this year in February uh, to assess the performance of the cluster and some of the issues that um, we are looking at uh, and have agreed as actions for this year is inter increased integration integration and uh, intercluster coordination. So we are working closely with the um, HLP uh, task force here to address the various HLP issues that you're facing because one of the key impediments for us in providing durable shelter is that land ownership and it's a key issue that we um, intend to address as well as enhancing ESNFI that is um, our shelter cluster and wash collaboration. In terms of technical coordination we would like to um, develop transitional shelter solutions specific to the regions. I'll touch a bit on this and also identify sustainable winterization assistance. Um, we intend to also look at uh, accountability to affected persons develop uh, specific AAP guidelines and uh, conduct uh, PCR trainings and protection mainstreaming. Other areas of improvement that we would like to do as a, as a cluster is um, 
strengthen reporting data analysis, feedback mechanisms, referral pathways, um, refine technical guidance, and also regular um, meetings. These are the recent uh, assessments that have been done. Um, we have shared the links there. Uh, we have referred to some of them in the previous slides that we shared, and I would just like to highlight um, like the rich whole of Ag Afghanistan assessment has been one key um, assessment that we refer to a lot in identifying the, the needs that we face here. I will talk a bit about the local architecture review and uh, cluster partner catalog uh, that was recently developed. And we also have some assessments on informal uh, settlements that we have here and several others that uh, we will share out. Um, for 2020, we have some planned assessments. We would like to um, study and analyze uh, sustainable winterization solutions. For a while, we have been giving uh, items for winterization. It's the repeat every every year in, every year out. So we like to see whether we can tweak a bit our strategy to come up with um, sustainable solutions for winterization. We will also be looking at um, undertaking regular post-emergency response assessments at household level. This ensures that we are prepared and ready uh, as we go into um, in the event that there is any uh, emergencies coming in. We intend to improve our post-distribution monitoring, uh, do some rental assessments. For the first four, we already have funding uh, from UNHCR through REACH, and uh, this will go on. Uh, for the last five, we are still appealing for funds. We would like to do policy gap analysis, uh, look, do some market assessments. In Herat area, we have a protracted case load there, IDP case load that has been there for a while and uh, with minimal support and also look at uh, land tenure and housing markets. We did a local architecture study um, last year, looking at uh, the different types of uh, shelters that we have here in, uh, in, in Afghanistan, uh, across uh, the different regions. And um, some of the key findings uh, here and uh, that we, we, we have seen is that Durable shelter needs have multi-sectoral implications. So they don't only address shelter needs, they address protection, livelihood, food security, as well as health also. Yeah. The other issue that we noted is uh, prevalence and access to material skills, local, local knowledge uh, for both uh, construction and repair vary considerably across the country. Lack of resources and impoverished, condi impoverished conditions that most Afghans face greatly constrain their ability to meet their shelter needs. Um, effective durable solutions should be based on local materials, building designs, construction practices, as well as uh, local shelter preferences. From the study, um, flat roof shelters uh, were seen as a preference by most of uh, those who were um, interviewed, and also winterization is one key issue. So most of the households cannot be able to um, uh, meet their winterization needs and end up burning plastics and other harmful materials during the cold season. And as mentioned, this is mainly due to lack of money. Um, this study was uh, released uh, uh, last week. So the next steps that we will be embarking on is analysis of the findings and also looking at piloting some of the potential shel shelters that are specific to the regions. And as you can see up there, um, we the, the shelters uh, cost range from $200 to 4000 which shows that there is an opportunity for us as a cluster to find ways of reducing the cost of uh, our transitional shelter. These are some of the shelters that were assessed. Over 26 different variations of huts, cotton tents, carved roofs, and flat uh, roof houses. We've shared links for the study and uh, you'll be able to go through. Um, uh, as mentioned, the regional uh, variations are, uh, are uh, mainly, uh, they differ in terms of um, building practices and also the need. Um, however, we have a shelter that are specific to some regions. For example, carved roofs in the north and west 
mainly due to the historical lack of sufficient uh, lumber. This is materials. Uh, we have flat roofs in east and southeast, mainly due to access of, uh, of lumber that is used for the roofing. Uh, black tents in south and southeast. This has to do with the temperature there, which is a bit warmer. Um, we also have stone shelter variations in the north, east, southeast, and central. And this is uh, common due to the availability, avail availability of, um, of materials there. And finally, cotton tents. Uh, these are mostly used in the urban environments by poor homeowners who cannot afford permanent shelter. The catalog, uh, the, the study also looked at what our partners are doing and they assessed 21 major cluster partners and the cost of their tea shelter ranged from uh, 1600 USD to 3300 and uh, as mentioned uh, with all this information that we have we plan to see how we can reduce the cost of uh, transitional shelter construction and also see how we can have and design regional based uh, shelter designs so a link on the um, this catalog will be shared. Finally, the gaps and challenges that we are facing. There is lack of durable shelter solutions for prolonged IDPs. And um, it's, it's a major barrier for us for their recovery. Uh, and um, as mentioned, this is one of the key advocacy that we are doing to get uh, funding for durable shelter shelters for these IDPs. Lack of land ownership is one key issue. Uh, we are not allowed to provide uh, uh, semi-permanent or permanent shelters for uh, those who are living in formal settlements, and it's one key issue that we continue to advocate with the government. Um, ESNFI cluster, the shelter NFI cluster is heavily underfunded. As mentioned, we have received 5% only uh, uh, of the annual requirement, and um, this is particularly concerning if you look at um, the scale of need that we have highlighted there. And we always uh, seeing that failure to meet these needs leaves millions of people vulnerable to disease, protection threats, and preventable uh, mortality. Over the last four years, uh, we have been receiving an average of uh, 30 million, and um, it's a very small amount. Last year, we received less than 30% uh, of the needs, um, and so, it's, it's really one of the key challenges that we face. Um, expansion of transitional shelter solutions and repairs to include rental assistance. This is one of the um, gaps that we are seeing. And as, in, as mentioned, we will do a rental, assist, a rental uh, assessment this year that can be able to advise us further in seeing how we can expand this. Looking at sustainable sources of funding to replenish the pipeline, as highlighted, um, it's critical to ensure that we have adequate supplies in country to be able to respond. Uh, the other issue is um, looking at integrated responses. This is multi-cluster response. Access to hard to reach areas is one key challenge that we have, especially in areas that are under non-state armed groups. Um, it um, prevents us from reaching those who are in need in those areas. And it's a key challenge that our, our partners face. But we are done with the presentation. Let me welcome questions, comments. Uh, please feel free to uh, raise your hand. Yes, please proceed. Uh, Fanas. Unfortunately, I can't see the hands. Um, if you can just, uh, I can see two hands up. Uh, if you can just proceed, thank you. Patrick, this is Brett. So thank you very much for the presentation. That was really comprehensive. Thanks to you both. It was um, not just comprehensive, but actually extremely interesting. And I think it was a wonderful opportunity to really explain the challenges um, that you have there. I've got a couple of questions um, to either of you or any one of your team who you think are best to respond. One is around HLP. Um, when you mentioned HLP is a challenge, it was around land ownership. I just was also thinking through the um, 
you know, have you looked at these opportunities for customary approaches rather than going through very kind of slow formalized systems? Is there kind of locally negotiated solutions that you can that can look at around that that have proved to be effective so far? And then secondly, around um, transitional and more durable shelter options, you said that there's a big gap there and a, and, and a need. Is the gap um, financial? Is it linked to the land issue or is it more technological that there isn't the practices there in the locations you need to succeed with a transitional shelter approach? Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Maybe I can just start and I'll start with uh, your last question. Um, the key impediment for uh, our transitional shelter response is funding, for sure. Uh, as I mentioned, the cluster is uh, really underfunded and you find that the little we receive, we end up um, responding to the various emergencies that we have that keep cropping up uh, every month as we go by. So the key thing is uh, funding followed by land uh, ownership. So we have uh, IDPs that reside in these informal settlements and um, majority of those informal settlements are privately owned uh, and it's a challenge for us to construct uh, shelters in those locations. That land ownership is one key issue uh, that prevents us from, uh, from, from, from constructing and we raised this. Uh, as Amadi mentioned, we had uh, the Head City meeting uh, last week and we did a presentation and highlighted this. Thankfully, HCT um, has, uh, has, uh, has, has promised to support us in a discussion with the government to see how this can be sorted out. We have a um, uh, presidential declar declaration and I will uh, call on Amadi to just mention a bit more on this that states that if an IDP, um, uh, if, 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 if an IDP uh, is uh, if someone is an IDP for X number of years, they're entitled to land and uh, ETCM. Uh, so, however, it has not been, been working well, um, and it's one of the key uh, uh, advocacy uh, that we do here in terms of uh, housing, land, uh, HLP issues, and one of the options that we have. Of course, in addition to uh, the, the, the customary option that you have mentioned. Uh, Amadi, would you like to add something on, on this, the PD1 item? Well, th thank you. I think from, from our past experience, uh, as you mentioned, uh, land tenure ownership, this, this and, and most importantly, land allocation has been an issue, and it's mainly because the government also do not have the capacity in, in, in that regard. Uh, one of the things that has been recently done by the government is 304 decree, which actually facilitates the distribution and allocation of land to IDPs, refugees, and returnees. This 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 has been this process has just started, but of course this is going to take a lot of time when when it, when, it, when it would be online. Uh, one of the uh, other issue that we have is that government does not have the database to know what government what what lands are owned by the government they have started this with the help of UN habitat and i hope that that would also improve the situation but it's it's there's a long way uh, to, to reach there so these are a lot these are the chances in addition to that land allocation has been a challenge in the past the 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 lands that are uh, allocated for idps they are they're mostly temporary for five to ten years but when they are allocated there are always disputes between different ministries on the ownership uh, we had a good example in herat where land was allocated to drought idps but then there were disputes that that was never resolved so these are actually the challenges that 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 we're trying to work with HLP and our government counterparts to address, but in the near time, we don't see a, a definite solution with the setup that we current, the government has 304 degree and the database that are developing. I hope this would this would be resolved as time passes. Thank you. Over to Patrick. Thank you. Uh, Brett, I hope that uh, answers your question. Yes, thanks very much, Patrick, and thanks. Amadi, very comprehensive. I won't speak anymore. I see there's a few more questions there. Yes, so we can go to Samir Kerr. Uh, welcome. 
Thank you. Hi, everybody. This is Samir. I'm uh, the IM of the Syria operation. And uh, thank you, of course, uh, Patrick and Ahmadi and the team for this uh, very good, uh, interesting and comprehensive uh, walkthrough um, of your operation. I have one question, um, and I think Ahmadi also uh, started to, to, to answer my question in his last response, is in the challenges that you presented, Patrick, in the end, uh, they are very uh, operational, uh, which is also quite interesting, yes. Uh, from an IAM perspective, is there anything um, that you know, produces challenges for the IM work? Like other gaps, uh, et cetera? Yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, uh, we face challenges uh, in, 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 in information management. Uh, however, I must say uh, we, we have come a long way. We currently use a report hub to do, to collect uh, the information from the partners, quite useful. Um, if you noted, I mentioned in uh, the action plan that uh, we have there, one of the key things we intend to improve on is reporting and data analysis, those two things. So um, it is one of the plans that we have going forward, improving the reporting using that tool of Report Hub and then further um, analyzing all these assessments that we have. There are a lot of assessments that have been done but there's more, more needs to be done in terms of data analysis and so how we, how, seeing how we can uh, use the data that we have received to guide um, the, the, the responses that we offer as a cluster. Previously, staffing was one key issue, but fortunately, I must say um, we, we are uh, at a better position right now. We have two colleagues that joined us in February in UNHCR as well as also IOM. So, the four colleagues that we have in, uh, in information management join us, joined us recently, and we hope to see more improved inform information management products and also um, data that can guide uh, our strategic res uh, our responses uh, strategically. Yeah. Would you like to add anything, Amadi? No, no, thank you. I think that that uh, it was specific to information management, but if it was also reference to to the land issues, um, as I mentioned earlier, the government has started up this process, which which would be a little bit complicated due to the fact that government majority of the government lands are grabbed by influential people and those that are in power so it's it's it would be also very much time consuming to identify those lands and register it uh, in the database that they have developed and uh, again uh, herbal planning is another issue which which has made things it's very much complicated. Uh, there are cities that have urban planning, but it's not implemented. So that is also going to make things complicated. Government control areas would be easier, but there are areas that are also out of government control. So these are actually the challenges in terms of collecting data and, and, uh, and making this a comprehensive data for 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 for, for the uh, partners that are that, that would need at least for the government for location of land thank you over to you patrick thank you very much samir i hope we have answered your question uh yes quite so and uh, i think it's interesting looking forward how um with the new capacity the especially also the access issues will be um you know access to the information management like and, and also inaccessible areas how this will be handled um I think we'll hear from that latest next year, right? <laughs> All right, thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, we can move on to Fanaz Arifian. Welcome. Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. It was very informative. Thank you very much. My uh, question is uh, with regard to actually is a request more than a question. The challenge of integrated multi-sector response. We know multidisciplinary, multi-sector, multi-organizational operations, actually, they are very challenging. I wanted you uh, Fanaz, I think we lost you there. I am here. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah, yes, yes. The last part, please repeat the last part. Thank you. The last part of your question. Was it clear now? 
No, no. The last part of your question. You talked about uh, integrated okay. response. Yes. Uh, okay, 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 okay. I'll repeat it then. Um, we know that, you know, uh, during the implementations, operational aspect, this integrated multi sector, multidisciplinary, multi organizational aspects are very challenging. Uh, it will be great if you could elaborate more on, you know, the uh, more detail in this uh, challenge, you know, which sectors, which organizations, local, international. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll just hi highlight one challenge here. Um, in 2018, we had uh, displacement due to drought, right? Um, and uh, we from we had a, we actually had a peer peer review uh, mission here in 2019 to look into that response. And one of the key things that uh, came up was that if we had responded earlier in those locations, yeah, we would have prevented um, uh, a lot of suffering and also all those resources that went into um, responding to the displacement itself. So the one of the key things that we are looking at this year is to make sure that um, there is joint response of all the clusters in the places of origin so that we do not have um, these displacements that would have been prevented uh, with proper planning and directing resources where it is really needed. Um, this is one of the key things uh, that, uh, that I can highlight in terms of the challenges on this issue of integrated uh, multi-sector response. And that's how we are looking at it. And um, we, as mentioned in one of the, some of the action plans there is, um, there's a need also for that integration with some of the clusters like WASH, yeah? The responses that we do in shelter, um, there's need for that integration because providing uh, a shelter without that WASH uh, aspect uh, is in futility. So there's that cohesion between the, 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 the different clusters uh, is of key importance uh, and for us and uh, we, 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 we hope to see improvement going forward uh, in, in our responses. Yes, Fanny. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other question? Patrick, if I can add yes. to Farana's uh, question and, and to what you yes. mentioned. Yes, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, um, just to complement, I think ideally what, I mean, uh, as an ICC, that's what we always aim for. And that's one of the ideal responses. And to very extent, we, we, were, we, were, uh, we were successful in that, of course, considering the complexities of the response in this complex environment the basic needs which is food uh, water sanitation i think these were to very much extent we were successful in that when we were providing response but of course there are challenges around it as well and and, and it's an, an effort if you give, give you give the example of 2018 and 19 displacements this was the time when we really started to focus on integrated response to use a good uh, to have a good use of the existing resources but of course there were challenges around that we we if, if i give you an example of how we deal with it here our winterization strategy for 2021 is a good example of it we used to have uh, the strategy only for esnfi cluster now we have started to develop it as a, an intercluster winterization strategy where we cover all the needs of the most vulnerable during the winter, but not only providing NFIs and cash for winterization, but also to address their food needs, their wash needs, their shelter needs, and other health needs. So I think that that th those are the efforts that are in place. The, the recently spring contingency plan that are developed is an intercluster plan, which actually addresses and ensures that we make all efforts towards integrated response. Uh, of course, there are again challenges when we connect them through transition recovery and development. This is something that we have been discussing quite for a long time. There are small efforts, but there's a long way to go ahead. Thank you. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you, Amadi, for that additional input. Any other question? I think uh, we do not have any other questions. So. That's uh, thank you very much for your participation.
I will hand over to Angel. Thank you, Patrick, and thanks, Amadi. Uh, this is Brett, and just a warm thank you to you both for the presentation, the content, the details. Um, the questions were really thoroughly answered, and I think it was a really well-rounded and informative presentation for everyone. So on behalf of the Global Shelter Cluster, um, on behalf of my co-lead, Ella, from IFRC, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to participate. Uh, very worthwhile hour well spent, and thanks for putting in um, the big efforts to such a great presentation. So thanks to you both. Thanks to your teams also for the hard work under really trying circumstances. We know there with a the drawdown at the moment, there's a lot of challenges going on. So um, keep us updated on the issues, support needed. We do have big networks that we can rally around some key things. From my side, I'd just like to remind everyone also, please to register on the meeting website on the shelter cluster um, we're, we're website, the meeting page on how it's circulated that. Uh, we will maintain these meetings at the same time every Wednesday, except during the period of the meeting. Next week, we have Palestine, and then following up after the meeting, we have Venezuela and then Mozambique. So I'd like to encourage you all to maintain your attendance. They're fascinating sessions. Uh, register online to get the updates and also to have the invitation embedded in your calendars. So from my side and the Global Shelter Cluster, thank you very much. Have a good afternoon, morning. <laughs>